Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming to this, the launch of Code Red. I'm Simon Davies. This is my partner in crime, Annie Mashon, who many of you know, um, a wonderful whistleblower of renown. Um, those of you who uh, were with us at the Snowden panel, uh, the big panel last night, uh, will have heard me ask Snowden uh, to reflect on what would happen, what would he do if he could make decisions about the greatest, the most eminent group of thinkers and campaigners ever assembled in this field. Um, I won't summarize his response, because he responded as an engineer, but uh, uh, he, he, um, he was very clear that the bringing together of so many disciplines and so many intelligences was absolutely necessary, and that's why we're here today. And uh, what I'd like to do, though, first, is pass over to the expert who is going to make sure we're all on the same page when it comes to the problem, what we're trying to address and why we're here today. So Annie, if I could throw to you for that task. Thank you very much, Simon, and thank you all for coming. Welcome to the launch of Code Red. Um, as he mentioned, I'm going to do the unpleasant bit of the afternoon, which is trying to outline the problem, and then he will come up with the solutions, uh, which I hope you will all become involved with. So my experience is as a whistleblower, as Simon mentioned. In the 1990s, I was working as a British intelligence officer for the UK Domestic Security Service, MI5, before resigning and helping my partner, David Shaler, blow the whistle on a whole series of crimes committed by the spies in the 1990s. Because of this, we ended up going on the run, literally, around Europe before the story broke in the newspapers. We had to live in hiding for a year, we had to live in exile for another two years, and David Shaler went to prison twice. First of all, when the British failed to extradite him from France to stand trial for a breach of the Official Secrets Act in 1998. And secondly, after he had returned voluntarily to the UK to stand trial in 2000. And of course, he was found guilty in a rigged court, and of course, he went back to prison. So it was a, a very intense few years and a very high price to pay. Um, and it's made me very sensitive to the issues that subsequent whistleblowers have faced. Because, of course, what we were doing in the 1990s was the analog era, um, and by which I mean it was much easier to go on the run and evade capture to make sure your message gets out there. But it was actually far harder to get the information out there effectively because the only means then was the, the old mainstream media. From, that, from those years, I learned a number of lessons. First of all, what it's like to live without privacy, because we knew, because we were being targeted by British intelligence, that our, t our communications were being intercepted. We knew that our home was probably bugged. We knew that some of our friends, in fact, were pressured to report on us to the authorities. So we had to live without a sense of any privacy for those years. And it's not... It's not like you know, you're trying to change the world every day of your life. You just want to have the privacy so you can talk to your mother. You can talk about family issues. You can sort out issues between yourself in a relationship or even have privacy in your own bedroom. And we felt we lacked that. Now, of course, what we're looking at is this industrialization of, of surveillance, which Edward Snowden has revealed. What we're seeing is an industrialization, globalization, of the security and surveillance capabilities, which means that everything we all do is being scooped up. Everything we all do can be watched, can be read, and can be stored for perpetuity. We have lost, globally, our sense of privacy. And it's a very corrosive way to live, and it completely undermines the sense of a democracy. Because if we cannot, as citizens, freely ingest freely read, freely write, freely speak, organize politically, have relationships in privacy, then we start to self-censor in how we speak and how we think and what we read, what we watch. Once you do that, democracy is dead because we will no longer be active participatory citizens. We will just be people who are frightened of the state. And this, of course, is why privacy was put in place as a basic human right, the Universal Declaration in 1948, straight after the Second World War, straight after the Nazi state, and straight after the horrors of the Gestapo. So we need to protect our privacy. 
the other lessons I learned from my whistleblowing years was also how the media, the old media, could be controlled and act as a blockage in the free flow of information. So certainly from the UK experience, there are a number of ways that you can control how the media will report serious crimes by the secret state. And that can range from recruiting journalists to just tip off the agencies if a hot story is coming through, to actively trying to shape stories and plant fake stories in the media. And if that sounds fanciful, there is a section in MI6, the James Bond wing of British intelligence, which actually is called information operations, or it was, which plants fake stories to manipulate how we think about certain issues. And it goes all the way up to um, collusion between top politicians, top spies, and top journalists and proprietors of the media. And again, we've seen this laid bare with the Rupert Murdoch News International phone hacking scandals in the UK. So this goes on, and I'm very aware of how easy it is to manipulate the old media. The other issue I learned as well was how difficult it is to maintain your privacy, your legal privilege, if you are involved in a whistleblower case and you want to be able to speak to your lawyers in privacy with legal privilege so that you can work out how to fight the legal case. And again, I've known since the 1990s that lawyers will be bugged, that they will intercept what are supposed to be privileged conversations. And again, this is one of the things that Snowden has confirmed is going on. So there's a whole range of issues um, around this lack of privacy. And we also see as well, well certainly I've noticed since I've become involved with the, the tech community, the, the hacker community if you will, um, how difficult again it can be to ask people within the hacker community who are experts in their field, who can produce the most amazing software to try and work around some of these issues, to draw them into some of these other um, groups, to cross-pollinate, if you will, between all these different groups. And I do think if we could pull these groups together and make them think and make them work together and give them the opportunity to speak to each other, then we can be greater than the sum of our parts. We will have a fighting chance to hit back. So one of the things that we need to do now, I think, is pull these groups, as I said, together. I speak at many conferences around Europe and North America, and I have seen the beginning of that process. But the key thing that is lacking tends to be the linkage between those groups and how to feed it into policy, how to make actual effective changes. Because what we're looking at at the moment is these people, uh, our stakeholder groups, are not being able to have a voice and effect law change. Whistleblowers try and affect legal change by creating scandals, by highlighting the issues that need to be confronted, as Edward Snowden did. Unfortunately, though, you get to a point where some of that will be stifled in the media, where people will not be informed of the issues at stake, and therefore they don't activate, they don't realise they need to contribute to the process. So I think this is one of the things that Code Red will be talking about and Simon will be expanding on. I think as well now, the challenges are even greater because the era that I blew the whistle in was sort of the analog era, it's 1.0. Now, of course, what we're looking at in the post-WikiLeaks environment is Whistleblowers 2.0, where the capability to scoop and grab huge amounts of crucial information to put out to the people to make them aware of what's going wrong in the world, what war crimes are being committed, what egregious abuses of privacy are being committed, against we the people across the planet. But it also makes it much more difficult for future whistleblowers to come forward. And we know again from leaks to WikiLeaks, ironically, that whistleblowers are now considered to be the insider threat. They are being targeted as much as terrorist groups are by the intelligence agencies. So there is this pushback to prevent future Chelsea Mannings, this pushback to prevent future Edward Snowdens, and I'm sure as I speak, there will be one or two or perhaps more sitting behind their desks in an intelligence agency in the US or the UK or in Europe thinking, I don't agree with this. This is wrong. What can I do? This is wrong, but I don't want to risk prison by exposing that wrongness. And these are the very people that by bringing all these different stakeholder groups together, 
the media, the lawyers, the tech community, the policy makers, that we can help future whistleblowers and ensure that they survive the process too, to build tools to make it possible for them to do it. Because they are indeed, as I said this morning, the regulators of last resort. If, if the mechanisms existed for meaningful reform, for meaningful improvement within the intelligence community, if mechanisms existed for meaningful engagement with our governments, and if the mechanisms, mechanisms existed for war criminals across the West to be held to account and put on trial and convicted if proven guilty, then perhaps we see some reform. But until that happens, and we're not seeing that happening yet, we still need to rely on the hope that more whistleblowers will come forward and expose the crimes, not only of our nation states now, but of this sort of globalized elite that seems to have evolved over the last 20 years. And this is what we need to push back against, develop tools to fight back against, and develop tools to help the whistleblowers until we can improve their lot. And that is precisely the problem we are facing, and that is precisely the solution that Code Red is proposing. So I will hand over to Simon Davis now. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. Um, as Annie said, I'll, uh, I'll, d I'll deal with the, uh, uh, the bits and pieces. Uh, but before I do, I just one thing I do want to say is this. Just so you know where I am, I cannot speak for the whole of Code Red. But having been a campaigner in this field, in fact, the first international campaigner for nearly 30 years now, uh, I have become tired of the solutions that governments offer to this problem. And of course, their primary solution is the law. We are expected to ob obey the rule of law. We are supposed to respect the rule of law. But the rule of law is becoming the problem. Because of the exceptions and the exemptions, national security and law enforcement can carve out for itself. We have very few options as citizens but to enjoy the fragments that are served up to us. So one of the reasons why Code Red has been started is to try and flip the common, the conventional wisdom. So, for example, I no longer accept that, or, that law enforcement and security authorities uh, act in the public interest. I believe that they are, in some respects, the greatest of criminals by holding hostage to fortune future generations, by pretending by keeping the lie afloat that democracy is a natural order for the human race, it is not. We op occupy a tiny, the tiniest sliver of freedom when you look at the history of, of this, this species. So it is truly wrong to create a cage, a surveillance cage for a population that can be harnessed by hostile governments of the future. This is another thing that Snowden uh, mentioned yesterday. So at the base of Code Red is how do we move forward? How do we create a new paradigm, a new narrative that can bring citizens together? Now, Annie mentioned that one of the things we intend to do is bring together communities of committed people, dedicated people, professionals, who currently are, are working more or less in isolation. So I want to just very quickly show you how we're going to do that. Um, this also is uh, an opportunity to launch the, uh, the new Code Red website built uh, by Sander over here, who's uh, done some wonderful work in this field for many of us. Um, and Code Red, which is codered.is, so we're, uh, we're going to have to take a trip to Iceland at some point, um, is, is, is going to be the, the online hub for uh, what we do and uh, so keep a, keep a track of that. Um, our mandate is very clear. The mandate which an advisory board of several dozen of the most respected people in, in several fields, uh, I, I talk about people like William Binney, uh, the former NSA technical director turned whistleblower, uh, people like Bruce Schneier and Whit Diffie, who are very much the fathers of modern security, um, all the, the chief, the key campaigners and policy makers, we all decided, working together with Annie and myself, that we create a mandate that would lay bare very clearly where we come from. And where we come from is 
a commitment to empower citizens at whatever price. Uh, one thing we will draw the line at is the cost to human life or liberty or dignity. But when it comes to organisations, I think all bets are off. I think we're at this stage now where the privacy is at the 11th hour. We're approaching that midnight point of no return. So we have to find new, perhaps more aggressive, but certainly more strategic solutions to try and preserve what little is left of privacy. And this is something for future generations. You know, everyone goes about, oh, what about the children? Yeah, well, what about the children? Don't use children to enhance the power of existing authorities at the expense of those children's freedom in the future. So we are very much aware of this. We're not radicals. None of us are radicals. We have this conversation regularly, don't we? I'm actually quite cons We're conservative because we want to conserve the rights that have been built over centuries. The radicals are the destroyers of those rights, and we've got to remember that. Now, as I see it, uh, the problem from a strategic point of view, from a campaigning point of view, and he mentioned some of this, is that we, we suffer from a lack of communication and cooperation, let's say between this huge technology community. I, mean, I don't know how many of you have been to CCC's Hacker Congress in um, Hamburg. 8,000 hackers. Now, to try and actually create a policy or a, law in, or, or a law reform dialogue amongst that group is extremely difficult. Um, because it's seen by so many people, because it's not part of the narrative, as a little bit boring and peripheral and who cares about the law anyway. But there are many law reformers who never speak to the hacker community. So at the same time that the Hacker Congress was going on uh, in Hamburg, you had the planning for the, the big data protection conference in Brussels, and there was no connection of any description between the two. And what we found is that we need to build constructive cooperative bridges. And the other problem we've got is information. And the third problem is we need a, a clearinghouse for strategy, v aggressive, functioning strategy that's going to make a difference. So let's just quickly work through these. Those are our targets, as you see. IGOs, for, they're the international government organizations, of course, the LEAs, the law enforcement organizations. These effectively are secret information systems. And Code Red is more than just targeting the sexy ones, these are the security agencies. Everyone goes, you know, it's really sexy to go after GCHQ or NSA. Uh, yeah, it is, and MI5, of course. But the really, you know, the less prominent stuff is actually perhaps just as important, and that is what do, what does Interpol do? Nobody knows what Interpol does. No one knows how its systems work. It is outside of the rule of law to some extent. How do the police operate? And Snowden, again, talked about this very dangerous but almost invisible trickle-down effect to law enforcement. Who watches the police? It's so fragmented that it's very difficult for campaigners, let's say, in one country or one state to know what is happening in the next state. So those are the targets that we have. And here's the way we're going to deal with it. Uh, these are the six main domains that we're going to try and uh, build bridges between. Now, there are, there are some connections between them, but they're fairly rare. But, for example, when I went to the Sam Adams Award, the, uh, um, the whistleblower award in Berlin, I didn't see any of my colleagues from privacy there other than Annie. Uh, now, there were privacy people there, many of them, but they didn't they weren't cooperating with this sort of larger population of privacy uh, um, operatives and privacy campaigners. So, and here you have, you have all of these different domains. So that's the first thing we're going to do is, is, is try and figure how we glue these together and get them working like cogs in a machine. Uh, and this just means a lot of hard work appointing ambassadors in different uh, spheres. Um, building the networks, getting the key network n hubs activated and, you know, working together. 
make, those of you who are academics will know this. Um, there used to be a time when it was acceptable in universities to work in isolation. So a law department just stayed as the law department. It didn't talk to anybody else. It wasn't interested. That's not acceptable anymore. Universities in many countries now have to be multidisciplinary. They have to work, departments have to work together. And that's how academia has evolved. The same with campaigning, the same with law reform. We've got to do what the universities have done and it's, it can no longer be acceptable to work in isolation. And that includes with the technologists too. A dialogue has to be created that everybody understands and everybody can interface with. So that's our first challenge. <laughs> but if that's not enough, here's the biggie. At the moment, we've got to flip data from vertical to horizontal. Anybody who has done research, uh, most of the journalists here will know this. Research is essentially, you have to either mine the work somebody else has done, so basically data mine it for the right inferences, or you have to go to an incredibly long process of going to individual websites, pulling individual files and pieces of data, which can take you weeks, months, years. I uh, always felt this was, a, this, this was a huge setback for all of us. So what we're gonna do is try and find a new data input standard. So when you publish, for example, leaked documents, when you publish legal findings, judicial findings, there is going to be a, a new data standard which will flip, which means that you can compare all of these currently vertical columns, you can compare them, contrast them, you can create, if you, you can create the story, you can f see the story, the threads that exist. And currently, that's, that's almost impossible. So that's, that's going to be a huge operation. We have somebody, who, who hopefully Olga will be joining us, who will be leading that project. Um, that will have to be in cooperation with hundreds of organizations to accept this standard. I don't know what our time frame is, but my guess is 12 months, possibly. We, we've got no time to lose on this. And let's take a look at the, uh, you talk about sexy objectives. This is the one that, uh, th this is very much where I'll be sort of hovering around. It's the st strategic element. Now at the moment, let's say that you are a whistleblower, you are a campaigner, or you want to bring a legal case against, let's say, a government. Where do you go for advice on how to use your energies? It's very difficult. You might pick an organization. Uh, you might hope that organization can help you. And it may or it may not. But one of the things we will uh, be doing here is to try and create greater certainty that the right strategy is used when, let's say, you've got information, you've got secret information that you want to disclose. So we're gonna create effectively a strategic think tank of the best thinkers, the best strategists from all the domains. There will be a lot of input to this think tank from people who won't want to be named. They're the people, for example, in the big brand marketing agencies who know how the media work. They know how the public pulse works. They want to help, but they don't want to be identified. And currently it's very difficult for them to engage their, their, uh, their um, interest. So having this strategic facility gives us an opportunity to be able to work with dozens, hundreds of new individuals who don't currently know how to operate in the area of, of um, civic reform. Now that is, in a nutshell, what we're gonna try and do. Um, within that is going to be the whole protection of whistleblowers, support for whistleblowers, um, you're right, Annie, that is, you know, one of the big problems is that there's a lot of information out there and it's very difficult for people to know where to put it. You can't just like call WikiLeaks and say, I'm gonna throw you this information. And WikiLeaks, in any case, might not be the way you want to go. They do a wonderful service, but that's not going to solve the problem. We know from the Snowden disclosures that just disclosing on its own isn't good enough. If it was, we wouldn't have a problem. I mean, one of the, one of the foundation stones for Code Red was this report 
uh, on what had happened in the one year since the Snowden disclosures. And we wanted a measurable, tangible assessment. We didn't want people to say wishful thinking, oh yeah, well, people are more aware. Well, they are. But we wanted to know what laws have changed, what protections have been put in place, and do you know what? You can count them on one hand across the world. Obama's commitments fell to dust, and most countries since then, in fact, have strengthened their security laws. They have, and they've diminished privacy. How does that happen? Okay, well, it's a terrorist threat. Well, one of the principles that I'd love to see Code Red adopt, and I think it already has, is that these people who keep taking privacy away on the grounds that there is a heightened security risk, they're doing this the wrong way, and the public is blindly accepting what's dished out to them. The greater the threat to public security, then the greater the test that should apply to governments. An evidential test. This is what I'm working with Amnesty International in Denmark over this at the moment because they had some shootings. The government is, 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 is introducing all sorts of new laws, as they are in France and elsewhere. But what needs to be done is a test. A test. Uh, and that test of evidence needs to be applied to governments. And this is what Code Red is going to do. A new narrative. Whenever a government, whenever the police or security say, we need these new powers because of this problem, we're going to say, prove it. Where is your evidence? Where is your measurable, testable proof? So that, in summary, is where we are at. Um, those are the details, as I say. Um, we're Code Red strategy in Twitter. Somebody took toad Code Red about three times. Um, so, what we should do, do you want to follow up any with any of these points? Um, I was just going to pick up on, on two bits actually. I totally agree that we need evidence because there have been so many examples over the last two decades at least that I can think of where the intelligence agencies have theoretically been challenged in public around what's going on and they lie. They have lied in the UK to the Parliamentary Oversight Committee. They have lied repeatedly to congressional committees in the US since Snowden went public, including James Clapper, under oath, and yet they're not being prosecuted for perjury. Um, so yes, turning it around and saying, what's your proof? Why do we need to erode uh, civil liberties for national security is a very good question. And trying to affect the policy that boosts the oversight, I think, is key. Um, the other point I would make as we're in Italy, and as I'm a Brit, in the 1970s to the 1990s, the British faced probably the most ongoing um, and dangerous terrorist threat we ever have, which was the provisional IRA, um, the troubles in Northern Ireland. And you know, if you lived in London in the 80s or 90s, bombs would go off on British streets regularly. And all these discussions around civil liberties were then had again and again. And at that point, when people were having their feet blown off on British streets, when they were being killed on a regular basis, the general public discourse was we are not going to give away our hard-won liberties that our ancestors fought for. Because yes, this is terrible, terrorism is frightening, but actually it's a crime, it is not a threat to the fabric of the nation. In Italy, of course, similar things happened through the 80s with the uh, so-called communist attacks, the Red Brigades and things like that, the Bologna attacks. I don't know quite what the discourse was at the time about giving away hard-won liberties, but I bet they haven't been given away in the same way that we all have across the West since 9-11 and the war on terror began. So it's just two thoughts I just wanted to pop in there. Actually, I'll, I'll add just one. Oh, this works, actually. Hello. It should. It should work. Ah, it does. <laughs> right, one thing I would add, just to supplement what you said, is um, I did an anal analysis of the shootings, the, mass, uh, the ma massacres that had occurred throughout the 70s, 80s, and the 90s. So, for example, some of you will remember Dunblane, mm. uh, where um, a guy called Hamilton just shot dead a whole gymnasium full of children. Um, where in uh, Port Arthur in Australia, um, um, Bryant, Martin Bryant, shot dead about 37 people. Now, the response to these, if you like, lone wolf attacks was simply uh, more police efficiency, gun control, and procedural uh, improvements. 
There was no attempt in any of those circumstances leading up to, say, the year 2000 to introduce mass surveillance, and you, you're right, Annie, that wasn't part of the... You know, everyone saw that the real issue was trying to sort out the practical on-the-ground issues like gun control, bomb control, bomb-making control. So, you know, why have we moved to mass surveillance now as the default solution to every attack and every threat? And that's got to be addressed, because that can't continue. No, I, I would tend to agree, and I think there was a perfect storm of opportunity in the 1990s in America, where suddenly the tech... Uh, possibilities took off and they were u in a unipolar world they could abuse that mm. position um, but I think probably you've heard enough from us um, we'd love to throw the floor open and any questions suggestions enthusiasms about how you think we could progress this would be very gratefully received oh god yeah please suggestions we're, we're at that sort of birth <laughs> stage so uh. do, we, do we need a microphone would you mind Antonella thank you Uh, uh. Hello and compliment. Uh, just uh, two questions. One is uh, uh, the terminology that typically is used there about security and privacy. We see, in, uh, at least in Italy, that in the last uh, 20 years has changed the meanings. The security 20 years ago was a, a different concept of what uh, now is, is told. So I, a suggestion, um, wanted to see some kind of uh, glossary and definition of uh, which are the, um, the value, which are the rights, which are the fear. And uh, this kind of analysis probably is very required because at the moment uh, we are seeing that uh, the technology um, promoted uh, from government or uh, from some political party was the same uh, after the 9-11 and are the same for immigrants uh, issue. So sometimes uh, this technology are like uh, the salt and uh, they just uh, get promoted using uh, some fear as a, as a lever. And the second point uh, is um, you mostly want to be uh, dedicated on uh, government surveillance or also corporate. Because at the moment uh, we have the growing of uh, um, corporations that are transnational, are collecting a huge amount of data, and uh, their profiling power is uh, maybe much more than uh, North Korea multiply for uh, DDR. Um, and I guess uh, they can be addressed for the future. I mean, one point I would make there is um, I totally agree with your, uh, your comment about the, the notion of security being elastic. Um, in the UK, particularly, we use the phrase national security, uh, which then is transmogrified into national interest or even the government's interest. Um, and, but as soon as you slap the phrase national security on any issue, it becomes forbidden to speak about it, forbidden to investigate it, forbidden to reform it. Um, and I think watching what America's done with homeland, homeland security since 9-11 is a sort of um, bastardization of it, actually. It's sort of metastasized, a bit like a cancer. It's just creeping everywhere. So I think getting back to hardcore definitions, um, uh, this is what I've been calling for for years. We need legal definitions for these issues. What does national security mean? And we need them particularly, for example, in Europe, under the article, um, European Convention on Human Rights, Article 10.2, Free speech can be inhibited to protect national security, which sounds fine. But if you don't then legally define what national security is, it can be abused, and it is. So perhaps some of these legalistic issues need to be addressed too. Yeah, we, we have a, a problem with... Uh, we have a real problem with the word privacy. Mm. Uh, in fact, I, I got to detest that word. It sounds stupid for somebody who you know created Privacy International to say this, but because so, I'm at fault, but, the, but I don't like the word anymore because it's so amorphous, it's so ill-defined. Mm. Governments can use it um, as, as much as people can, but it's, it's a passive word, you know? It doesn't have that sort of um, ability to, to unite populations with a common cause because it's like punching at a cloud. There's, there's, there's no form to privacy. But there is to threat... Threat has a pointed edge, a point that can hurt, uh, but can easily be felt. So we have to find terminology which is as powerful, as uh, definable, um, as, as, as terror, as threat, as risk. So this point you make is, is exactly true. And I also, the, the corporate, you mentioned the corporations. Um, 
they've been stung, I think, by what's happened. But I don't, I don't think it stopped most of them. Um, but we have to hold companies to account. And we talk about a definition. When Microsoft, Google, Yahoo, any of these companies say, we are going to provide stronger security and end-to-end -end encryption. Well, what does end-to-end -end encryption mean, and why is it even relevant? Mm -hmm. what, if, uh, what if somebody's put a bolt hole in the, you know, this damn great trap door in the middle of the encryption? What if they're still giving the keys away? What, you've got to hold companies to account on these claims that they make, because it could be, as far as we know, it could be business as usual, mm -hmm. and the partnership between government and corporation still exists as strong or even stronger than it was before Snowden. But we have to hold the, their feet to the fire <laughs> to get the proof that their claims are true. I just want to point out, Code Red does not support torture in any way. Ah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, just one other final point on the corporate side. Um, I, I would agree as well, because our previous experience um, has been nation-state level surveillance. And obviously, as we know now from Snowden, we're looking at uh, integrated global level surveillance, particularly from the five eyes. So it's, it's sort of grown. But um, I'm well aware that corporations also hire um, pro corporate spy companies, I would say mercenary spy companies, to spy on pot potential activists, political opponents, that sort of thing. I mean, I remember reading some uh, report a few years ago saying if you went on any environmental demonstration in the UK, the chances were that one in four people there would be employed in some way as uh, an informer or working for a corporate spy agency. So that is another thing. It's not just the state level actors. It's also this burgeoning private security firms, which don't just provide muscle in the Middle East, they spy on us too. First of all, congratulations. It's a, it's a massive challenge you're taking on yourself. Like privacy is a massive, obviously, um, subject. And I, I want to emphasize on the corporate um, because you know it, the lawyers for privacy are the most uh, growing mm -hmm. occupation among, uh, among the legal world. Um, there is a organization called IAAP that I think you should check. That is based in the state. That is the the, com the uh, committee for. Privacy lawyers, the 3,000 privacy lawyers are beating every year there in, in DC and talking about legislation and all the, and it's, it's amazing how much they're doing basically to give companies the ability to break <laughs> privacy all the time. And they're the one that I think should be a lot on your targets because they're the ones who supply the government a lot of the information. And they are only now building the legislation and trying to implement all kind of, of mechanism yeah. to basically get away with breaking privacy. Are we talking TTIP here as well? Is that part of TTIP? Not sure. No, yeah. I, well, IAPP is the Association of Privacy Professionals. Uh, and actually, you raised a really important point. My, I've got a blog called The Privacy Surgeon, and I wrote a very unpopular article a year ago saying, well, where were, you, where were all you guys? Like all you privacy professionals who go and say we care about privacy in Verizon or AT&T or where were you before Snowden? You know, why, why didn't you blow the whistle? You know, these meetings that you have where all slap each other on the back and say we've got the best privacy policy, but nobody ever disclosed their relationship with government. You know, so you're right. That organization representing thousands, I think they've got 17,000 members or something. I think 40,000 now. They were... Is it? 4,500 five years ago, there are 40,000 people. I, don't, I remember there were like two people and a dog in a back shed. <laughs> they're just like, you're right, they're grow, yeah. growing really fast. But I mean, you're talking about the people who are the custodians of our information, and they just zip total silence mm. before Snowden. And after Snowden, of course, they all closed ranks and had an agreed, di you know, agreed narrative of, of what they should say and what they shouldn't say. Um, but you're right, we've, that is a very important... Group so this is one thing, and the second thing that is all this conversation is very much rotated in the Western agenda and thoughts. And you know, we're talking about third world countries, developing countries, global south that just you know don't get close to talk about privacy, and it's broken on a daily basis. So definitely, if you move in quite fast to work with these governments, so maybe there is a chance that you know when time comes they put things correctly in place. Otherwise, it's going to be very too late. Mm -hmm. No, I totally agree. In fact, that was a point um, we we're going to use to wrap up. It's an, of course, the focus at the moment is the anger from you know, the NSA and GCHQ, US, UK. Um, but what we want to do with Code Red, uh, particularly with the sort of 
the clearinghouse and the strategies that everyone can use is compare and contrast different practices from across the planet. Um, and so we can all learn in different ways, not only what the problems are, but also what different solutions might be out there too. So. Yeah. And, and, and you know, the, on that point, of mm. these don't have to be the big targets, you know. I mean, one of the most notable privacy campaigns in British history was to do, I mentioned this briefly yesterday, spy chips in wheelie bins. You know, do you have wheelie bins in, uh, in Italy? You know, you get put all your garbage in a big green bin and it's got wheels and you wheel it to the front and a big truck takes it, tips it out. You've got those here, I'm sure. Um, well, in the north of England, it was discovered that councils had, uh, this is local government authorities, has started putting RFID chips in the wheelie bins. Now, okay, you might not think this is a big issue, but they did it in secret. And all they were doing was collecting, identifying data about who owned that bin so that they could detect the weight of the bin, okay? And it caused riots, I, literally riots. I mean, they didn't care about GCHQ spying on them. They cared that their councils had covertly put these spy chips in their bins, right? People were burning their bins on, in, in public streets. There were bomb, bin burning parties. There were people like f detective, uh, former detectives were, were, were coming out and uh, they, were, they, they were calling for civil resistance. Mm -hmm. Now, you might know that that's a privacy issue to people. Um, so we're going to be, you know, asking people, not, just don't focus on the big three-letter agencies, four-letter agencies. Look at what your local police station is doing, which is, believe me, not very savoury, usually, particularly in the US. And the UK. And, well, and the UK. Basically, these are licensed criminals. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of these police are operating right outside the law. But there isn't that much focus because it's not sexy. So we're going to be asking people to focus on their local police, focus on the local authority, focus on the local corner store, because that's how we'll engage the public. Mm -hmm. Because lots of different you know, heartstrings, and people can pick and choose. We only have a few more minutes left. I think there are two questions still to go. Um, yeah. uh, this is the first, the gentleman was first. Um, so Oren mentioned developing countries. I was going to say three in particular where the security and uh, terror agendas, particularly, you know, it's bound up in legislation and insurgencies and whatnot. Um, South Africa, obviously, mm. where there's a huge push from civil society, um, India, uh, and then Kenya, in for obvious reasons, very recently, again and again and again. So, I mean, those three where there are sort of, you know, whatever tier of democracy you want to call them, second tier, whatever, that those seem to me in that their particular pressure points and all of the discussions that I've had seem to, those names keep coming up. Places where, and in India, it's particularly difficult to have, you know, what you said about national security being slapped on something once that label is there, it's impossible to discuss anything. Um, but I, I want to ask just what specifically does Code Red, you know, what do you want from journalists and journalism? Because, you, you know, you talked about the sort of choke point of old media, so what do you feel now are the possibilities for journalists? You know, we're sitting in a, a, a you know, we are base of, you know, ideas and everything else, lots and lots of panels on investigation and leaks and everything else, so what specifically does Code Red add for the journalism community? I could lead, I'll, I'll lead off on this, okay. Two, two things come to mind, the first is we think that this new data, this new data, uh, model is going to be tremendously valuable for journalists and we'll be seeking the support of journalists in trying to make sure that that is intelligible and useful as a device. So we want a cooperation with media but from my perspective more importantly is this question of evidence. I don't see enough journalists demanding evidence from politicians. It's far easier just to create a headline. A politician claims this National Security Agency claims this. A return, a, a reinvigoration of the, the, the first tier of investigation, uh, investigative journalism is to ask why. Why? That's all you have to do. But so many journalists, I'll just get the story. Chief of staff, you're, you're busy. Chief of staff says, just get the story. I don't, I'm not interested about the, you know, the evidential basis. 
it's a good headline because this politician or police uh, constable claims this. So I, I'd like to see sort of that greater support for journalists being more investigative, even at that first tier. Yeah. One final quick comment, and then I think we have to wrap. I had just a, a quick comment uh, regarding the wheelie bins that uh, Simon talked about. We've had those uh, bins with chips in them, RFID uh, tags, in the Netherlands, where I'm from, um, for many, many years. And where they caused riots uh, in the north of England, um, they didn't cause any riots or any consternation whatsoever in, in the Netherlands. And that's, in my opinion, an even scarier prospect mm -hmm. than that there is no discussion whatsoever regarding uh, uh, privacy implications as well. And that's, you know, I think, um, with the word privacy as well, it's a bit abstract and it's hard to, to make it clear to people um, what the threat really is and, and what we can do about it. Yeah, what happened in, in Holland? Holland, it was only 30 years ago that you guys created one of the world's most notable privacy campaigns. Like a third of the country rose up and risked imprisonment by refusing to fill in the census, <laughs> right? The, it was a huge national campaign of global proportions and now, I'm not going to characterize everybody in Holland, okay? That would be stupid, but, but the government... I won't is take offense. <laughs> <laughs> but the government's getting away with anything it wants, any claim it wants. Is that, and this is increasingly the case in... in it's like a domino effect across the world. Mm. Very much so. I think we're probably going to have to wrap. Um, I will leave Simon with the last few words, but I just want to say a huge thank you to Antonella for helping us organize this. And uh, working with the CL CILD has been a pleasure. And thank you to the team for um, filming this and live streaming. Yep. And I'll just uh, repeat those thanks and, uh, and, and say that anybody who wants to get involved, um, there's details of how to reach us on the website. And please do get involved and please do ask us to keep in touch with you because there's just some very, very exciting uh, adventures ahead for us. Uh, and that's saying something given the adventures we've already had. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for coming. Just one quick word, uh, we uh, are the, the CHIL, the Co Coalizione Italiana Libertà e Diritti Civili. Uh, yesterday we were involved in the event with uh, Edward Snowden and we're having a few panel uh, today as well. Uh, we are happy to, uh, we were happy to help uh, organizing this presentation and if you're interested in these issues uh, in Italy, you can go to uh, CHILDITALIA.org our website and also contact us and we will be in touch with with code red and uh, the international community thanks a lot Thank you. Thank you.